All right, I'm going to need that. Right. Thank you. All right. Got something up my sleeve this morning, so I'll let you know in a minute. Um, we might need a prayer before we start. Anyway, all right, let's, uh, let's pray. Give us time to the Lord. Ask Him to open our minds, open our hearts. We might receive His truth and act upon His truth. Let's pray. Father, Lord, it's a humbling thing to, to come before this congregation every Sunday and, and share because I know that my power is not enough. And what power I have comes from you. So God, I pray, speak through me. God, may it, may it be all of you, none of me. God, may, may you get across what it is that you want to deliver to your people today. So Lord, help me to be attentive. Help me to be a conduit through which you work. Well, thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So we have had a fairly... Uh, I don't know if I'd say emotionless journey through the book of Acts, but uh, nothing quite as emotional as what we're about to experience today. And I forgot I didn't bring my water up here, so uh, I'm going to need that before. <laughs> uh, all right. My mouth gets way too dry when I preach. So, but if you didn't bring your Kleenexes today, you're probably going to need them. Let's, let's just say. Now, we've already had two funerals, uh, and, and rather expeditious funerals at that. Y'all remember chapter 5. Who remembers the uh, name of the two people that God took out because they lied? Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira. Very good. And now, I mean, I, <laughs> my mind goes back to this journey and this moment where these two people, I mean, boom, one's dead. They bury them just instantly and before the next one could get there uh, the burial had already happened and then the second one comes along and dead buried over and done but now we're going to have a rather emotional death here in uh, chapter 7 but we're starting in Acts chapter 6 verse 8 now I'm going to have y'all help me preach this a little bit this morning. So I need about five volunteers to read this morning. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm stepping out on a limb here that five people be willing to do it. I've got a lot of faith. All right, we got one, two, three, four, five. All right, praise God. Uh, yeah, wow, I love it. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you the four points now. Number one, the man, and this is Stephen we're talking about. Number two, his message, and that's the part you're going to help me with today. His martyrdom and his murderer. So now we'll, we'll, we'll dive into it and break it down a little bit. Um, I'm going to go ahead and have the passages assigned. So uh, some of them are... One, one's a, maybe 14 verses max. So if I could have somebody take Acts chapter 7, 1 through 8. All right, Ed, I see. Right, Ed, you got, you're going to start us out. Acts 7, 1 through 8. And, and I, now, you have to be willing to read it into the microphone. So just, all right, we're, we're all hearts clear. Good. All right. Uh, <laughs> second one, Acts 7, 9 through 16. All right. I, I, I'm competing between two here. Uh, uh, <laughs> Deborah, we'll do ladies first. Deborah, how about that? Uh, so we'll give you Acts 7, 9 through 16. Brandon, we'll give you um, 7, 20 through 22. Um, we got two left. 7, 23 through 29. Kimberly, Kara, I saw your hand too. You'll, you'll, you'll take, I'll let you take the last one. 7, 30 through 43. So, all right. With that said, let's dive in. 
Uh, it's going to be just a little bit before we get to those things. But let's look at the man first. Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Let's look at this man for a minute. He was first introduced in Acts chapter 6 in last week's sermon. So if you go back to uh, verse 5 for just a minute. It says, And the, say, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen. Remember, they, they chose seven people to meet the need for uh, that. Uh, you know, these widows were getting neglected with the daily food distribution. So they chose seven men, and the first one that Luke uh, mentions under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is a man named Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 8 says he's full of faith and power, but not only that, he did great wonders and signs among the people. So he, he was, he, who he was was key, but also what he did was key because he was empowered by God. Let's, let's continue to look. What, what else about this man? He was an innocent man. Let's look at verse, verse 9. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. So here come these religious folks again, griping and complaining. Are we surprised at this point? No. Verse 10, And they were not able to resist or disprove the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. I'm going to go out on a limb here to say, have you understood that liberal thinking does not like to be challenged with logic? Oh, I could say a whole lot about that. But anyway, I'll leave it there. So I see a similarity though that they couldn't, they couldn't resist, they couldn't disprove, and that makes people mad. So we're seeing now in this day and age that people get downright angry and they start hurling insults and calling people ridiculous names when they don't have a good solid point to prove. Anyway, verse 11. This innocent man, he couldn't be disproved, so they had to create a case against him. Look at verse 11. Then they secretly induced men to say, and, and, and in other words, are getting them to lie under oath. We have heard him speak blasphemous words about Moses and God. Now, if you heard about that here in church, that somebody in this church was speaking blasphemous words about Moses and God, that, that, would, that would sound like a good spiritual complaint, right? It would sound spiritual if all you do is listen to it on the surface and not ask questions to find out, okay, well, what are they saying? Verse 12 says, And they stirred up the people. People that have itching ears and love to hear good gossip and juicy stuff, it doesn't take much to stir them up. You, see, you say the, the, just the right thing. Oh, yeah, give me more. Tell me more about it. Oh, yeah. And, 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 you, and you better embellish on the truth. Or otherwise, you know, you, you might lose your audience. So it stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him violently, in other words, and brought him to the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man does not, uh, does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place. Now, he's, he's going a little bit further and they're saying, Stephen is speaking against the temple. And that's, that's a no-no for religious people. You attack their building, their place of worship. And it's time to throw down. So, and then on top of that, you speak against the law? Oh my, it's on. So, verse 14 says, We have heard him say that Jesus, this Jesus, notice that derogatory tone again, that this Jesus of Nazareth would destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us and all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him 
saw his face as the face of an angel. They created this case, their primary accusation that was he was speaking against the temple and against the law. Yet here this innocent man sits there radiating the glory of God. Try just just put your place yourself in that place for a minute. Maybe you've been falsely accused and and you've been somewhere where you're sitting there and and you're taking it over and over. I mean, they're just hitting you with false accusation after false accusation. Some of us, I mean, we'd be like them. You fight, we fight back. We got bigger gloves. let's, let's, Let's do this thing. But Stephen, he just sat there. And he gets ready to talk in a minute. And he's got a message to declare that's pretty strong. Now, he's dealing with a lot of religious people, so he had to give them some Old Testament history. And he's going to do that in rather great detail. But this innocent man maintained his testimony and humbly sat before his accusers. Could you and I do that? I don't know that some of us could. We'd be quick to defend ourselves. We'd be quick to say, oh, this is poor pitiful me. Why why am I going through this? But he just sat there with the face of an angel. And his response only gets better as we get toward the latter part of chapter 7. Now let's look at his message. And I'm going to let you all help me preach this message this morning. First of all, you're going to see later that Stephen addresses this subject about the temple. They're trying to make the big deal about the temple being the place where, you know, this is where God's glory dwells and God's presence can't be anywhere else. It has to be contained to a temple. And Stephen very succinctly says, no, God's presence has always been with his people. And it begins with Abraham in chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. Ed, I think you've got that, so I'm going to bring you the mic and let you read that to us. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The glory of God appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham was, had no child, he promised to give him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land, and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them for 400 years. And the nation whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. All right, thank you. You can tell this man had an online radio station, can't you? <laughs> thank you, Ed. Um, that, 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 is, that, that is a voice for sure, a, a good on-air voice. All right, God's presence was with Abraham. Let's just think about the story, and we're going to try to just sum it up quickly. That, okay, Abraham, he grew up in the land of Ur. God says, okay, get up from where you're going. And I'm trying to imagine this scenario and how it plays out. God says, get up and leave your hometown. Okay, God, where do I go? Just go. I like details. 
God didn't give him details. God just says, go, and I'll show you. Just, just start packing up, start walking. And through all of this, it mentions uh, oppression and, and, and all, of, all, all of these hardships. But in the end of this section, it talks about the covenant that God made with Abraham. And this guy that uh, grew up in a rather wicked place was still used of God. And, and, and uh, we have a, a, a taste of that impact today. God's presence was with Abraham through the good, through the bad. Let's go now to 7, 9 through 16. Deborah, I think you have that one. Is that right? And the participants moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, and God was with him, and delivered him out of all his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now there came a darth over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers found no suggestus. That's what I thought. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known, known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. So jo Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Sashem, and laid in the sculpture sculpture that Abraham brought for a sum of money of the sons of Immor, the father of Sisim. All right, thank you. That's all right. Uh, um, if there's anybody that I thought had a bad, bad deal dealt to him, it's Joseph. And Stephen is reminding that even though his brother sold him into slavery. And then, you know, he, he, he went through all the hardship and the accusation of being with Potiphar's wife. And, you know, he, he runs and, you know, he's in prison and all of that. God was still with Joseph. Uh, God eventually reunited him with his family. And all was well and good. So we're reminded that God's presence was with Joseph. But now, God's presence with, was with Moses. I, I'm going to read the next few verses leading into it. And then, um, Brandon, I think you've got the next section, if I've got that correct. Verse 17 says, But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, until another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people, and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. This leads into the time of Moses. Moses, in a pre-birth, his life was at stake. So let's go ahead and go with that next passage, Brandon. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. I knew that was coming. Oh, my. Read, brother. Lord, <laughs> Lord, we pray for Caleb. <laughs> in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him with her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. All right. Thank you. So th this, you're going to see Moses, this, this sermon actually gives three stages of Moses' life. First you see the early stage. Moses was well-pleasing to God. You see there in verse 20. Uh, he was brought up in his father's house for three months, set out Pharaoh's daughter, takes him, raises him. And verse 22 says that Moses was mighty in words and deeds. So, so far a pretty good start. 
Let's look now at the next stage of Moses' life. Kimberly, I think you got that next passage. All right, starting in verse 23 through 29. <clears throat> and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words. Oh, sorry. Now, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffering wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptians. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God delivered them by his hand, but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to the two of them as they were lightning and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you the ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptians yesterday? Then all, then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of is it Median? Mesopotamia. Mes Mesopotamia. Uh, yeah, that's why. I, or no, land of Median. I'm sorry. Median, <laughs> land I'm of Median. Another verse. Where he had two sons. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I was thinking Mesopotamia from the earlier part of the chapter. Uh, and the bad part was the Bible was right in front of me. <laughs> anyway, uh, now you look at the next phase of his life. Forty years old, and. Uh, Oppressed, it says uh, in verse uh, 24, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. That sounds like the kind of guy you want on your side, right? He, he, he stands up for you. Verse uh, 25, he, he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting, tried to reconcile them. Uh, man, your brethren, why, why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Now, now, now get a hold of this here. God had put Moses in this place of authority, and they were questioning his authority. Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? And now... He's getting real here. He said, yeah, I saw you kill that guy yesterday. You going to knock me off? But Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian where he had two sons. But God wasn't done with him, thankfully. Let's look at the next phase. And uh, we got Akira. Thank you. Yeah, 30 to 43, yeah. Now when forty years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. Sinai? Sinai, yeah. In the flame of a fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he drew near to it, to look, there came a voice from the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. The then the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their groaning, and I have come down now to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they had rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man sent God, this man God sent as both a ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea in the wilderness of, for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise you up for a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to, f to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey 
him, but thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for gods who will go before us. As for this, as for this Moses who led them out from Egypt, we do not know what has come become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the words of, of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the books of the prophets. Did you bring me to slay the beast and sacrifices during the 40 years of the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch mm -hmm. and the star of your god, Raphan, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you to in, into exile beyond Babylon. Thank you. All right. Now we're looking at this latter half, that God's presence was still with Moses, and God, God appeared to Moses in the wilderness. Uh, you, may, you may think, Matthew, why on earth did you have people read these passages? Well, well you're going to discover that nearly... Uh, 70, around 70 verses of scripture are being covered in this one message. So I'm thinking, they may rather hear somebody else read some of it than me. But anyway, here, go, look back at verse 30. 30 uh, 40 years have passed. An angel of the Lord appears to him in a flame of, uh, y'all probably remember the story of the, the burning bush. Uh, God reveals himself to Moses in such an awesome and wonderful way. I would, I would love to have just been, you know, fly on the wall or fly in the desert or whatever at that time. But he goes on and, uh, you know, in verse 33, it says, And the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals, reverence. Take the sandals off your feet for the place where, on your sta uh, where you're standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now, come, I will send you to Egypt. And this Moses, whom they rejected, saying, "Whom you made you? Who made you a ruler and a judge?" Is the one God sent to be a ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel who had appeared to him in the bush. So he brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. And now Moses, in verse 37, makes this prophecy about Jesus. It says, The Lord God, your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected. And in their hearts... They turn back to Egypt. Now, just, just think about this for a minute. You are the one spiritually leading these people. And they're so stubborn. You're, you're, you're trying to lead them the right way, and they're complaining, and they're, they just can't seem to accept the goodness that's ahead of them. You know a lot of us are like that at times. We, we know that God's, uh, His will is the best thing for us. Yet, we challenge it. We fight it. Because we're used to another way. We're used to the way that the devil has tried to sell us. So God turned, verse 42, gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. This is coming from Amos 5, 25 through 27. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness of house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch, so these false gods, and the star of your god, Remphon, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. I can't imagine how hard it was for Moses leading a people whose heart kept going back the wrong way. But God was still with him. God was still with him. But now, here is where Stephen's message starts to get a, a, a little bothersome. Starting in verse 44, he pretty much tells them God's presence is not restricted to a building. 
these people who worshipped the temple, who idolized the temple, did not like what he was about to say. And you're going to see how ugly it gets starting uh, in, in around the 50s, uh, the verses, especially when he starts talking to verse 51. But it says, verse 44, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land, possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. Verse 48. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. Mic drop. As the prophet says in Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? So God, God is everywhere present. And for you and I who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells within us and everywhere we go, we have Him with us. We have His power and His presence. We have all that we need. That ought to make somebody shout. Amen. Whew, all right. We have all that we need in Him. But now this is the turning point. Oh, if you think these guys aren't mad by now, look at, look at the word choice. If y'all ever think I'm direct and bold, I don't think I've ever been this in your face as, about, as Stephen's about to be in verse 51. He says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. That'll bless you, won't it? <laughs> you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Said So not only are you rejecting, but... You grew up seeing this model before you. I, I bet now, because I, I know some people, and let's just be honest, I, I think all of us are like this to a degree. Don't you mess with my mama and daddy. <laughs> and Stephen did. He said, your father's before you did it. It's like, oh no, it's on now. But Stephen, he keeps going. Verse 52, which of, the fathers did your fa uh, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. So now he's, he's pointing it out. You're betrayers. You're murderers. You're responsible for this. Who having received the law by the direction of the angels and have not kept it. They rejected the one who came to fulfill the law of the Lord Jesus Christ. We love for verse 54 to say, Now when they heard this sermon, the altar was flooded and everybody repented and whistled merrily out the church doors. It's not that way. Let's look now at Stephen's martyrdom. Verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. So in other words, they were convicted. They knew they were guilty. They had to do one thing, either respond positively and, and align with God or reject and go another way. Well, they decided to reject and go as, as far uh, in the wrong direction as they could. It says... They gnashed at him with their teeth. I'm trying to picture this. <laughs> Verse 55. But he being full of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. I want to say one more, about, one more thing about their response. Anytime people are normally convicted and you have hit the nail on the head, 
people will lash out because they feel like they have to defend themselves. You let them know, hey, you've done wrong. And I don't know too many people that would say, well, thank you for letting me know. Most of the time, say, but I had a good reason to do it. Or, well, what I did wasn't as bad as what Sue did. I'm picking on Sue. <laughs> That's not saying that Sue's done anything bad, but I, I'm just saying we, we love to take, <laughs> we love to take and compare, and we lash out, and we don't want to accept the reality of where we've been and what we've done wrong. And that's what they did. They got angry. Well, let's go back to verse 55. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. Get picture this. Picture this. He gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Most of the time when you read scripture, is Jesus seated or is he standing? Seated. Most of the time we, we, we read that he is seated at the right hand of God. But in this case, when Stephen is about to die for the cause of Christ, Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. What, when, when do we typically stand? We stand in honor. You know, at a graduation, we stand in honor uh, of the graduates. At a wedding, we stand in honor of the bride. We don't do that for the groom, but we, we do it for the bride. Maybe it's because, girl, you're about to marry some whack dude and you need all the blessing you can get. I, I, don't, I don't know, but they need all the honor they can get, right? All you ladies, shout. But Jesus gives pretty much Stephen a standing ovation. Such a beautiful thing. And my sanctified imagination could go a lot of places. And, and maybe some of the things that might have been going through the mind of Christ, I, I can't say it because it's, it's not in the text here, but obviously it was a well done, good and faithful servant moment. Stephen sees the heavens open and he sees Jesus standing there. In verse 56, here, here they are getting ready to kill him. And he says, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then this convicted, angry crowd begins to throw stones at an innocent man. Look at verses 57 and 58. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their feet, or their clothes, at the feet of a young man named Saul. Hold on to that name. And look at Stephen's last words. Very similar to the words of Christ on the cross. Verse 59, And they stoned Stephen and he, as he was calling on God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. If you were just breaths away from dying, what would you and I say? I don't know that we would have the grace to do this, but God's grace is sufficient. Elaine Childers and I were having that conversation just a few weeks ago about how God, when we're faced with dying grace, God gives it to us. But trying to imagine it beforehand, it's a hard thing to think that we would handle it as well as Stephen did. In this turning point moment of the church. So he gives these last words and he dies. He breathes his last breath. Let's look at his murderer. You already saw him in chapter 7, verse 58. His name is Saul. Chapter 8, verse 1 says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. It's believed that he was the ringleader of Stephen's death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Saul's persecution and this death 
of, of Stephen. Let's, let's be honest. Some of us, if we were around, we, we, thought, we might be thinking, it's about time to get out of town because we might be next. So naturally, some of these earlier believers went to other places. That turned out to be a blessing because the gospel actually got to other places. But the apostles stayed. Thank God they didn't run too. Somebody had to stay around. So they did. And devout men, verse 2, carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. I wish that I could end this message with something lighthearted. I'm going to give you a little spoiler though. This Saul that was going door to door trying to imprison and kill Christians, some of y'all know the spoiler already, he's the Apostle Paul that wrote most of the New Testament. So he ended up becoming a believer. But if you look in Acts chapter 22, he never forgot the death of Stephen. It never got out of his mind. I'm sure if Paul would have gone into much more detail, he would have elaborated on how this man died with such grace and such dignity, even though he was an innocent man. The death of the first Christian martyr didn't stop the gospel. It only furthered it. And, it, and some of us right now, we're, we're in life and the least little thing happens and we think it's the end of the world. No, really, it's the beginning of another opportunity. And we, and we need to just trust God. I'm going to throw this question out. I threw this out on Facebook after our movie night a few weeks ago. Some of you may remember little stickers, bumper stickers and signs on walls. It's an old question and I haven't seen it in years. But if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I don't ask that in a condemning tone, but I ask that out of concern because I would love for every one of us to be able to say, Yes, Matthew. Not only the reality that I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, but I've followed Him. Yes, I've messed up along the way, but I've tried to be obedient. I've tried to yield my life to Him and allow His Spirit to work through me. You might be here today and say, Matthew, I don't know that there's enough evidence to convict me. Some of you might be saying, Matthew, there is no evidence at all to convict me because I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. Yeah, I've gone to church. I've done churchy things. I've done religious things. Sung religious songs. Prayed the right prayers. But have you truly trusted Christ? If, if you were faced with a Stephen moment, would you be able to say, that, oh yes, I'm going to see the heavens open. I'm going to see my Savior. Or maybe you're sitting here in doubt today and say, Matthew, I don't know. I don't know who I'll see. I may, I may see the flames of hell. I don't have a clue. It's time to answer that question honestly and respond. Now, don't, don't turn a deaf ear and say, okay, well, Matthew, I know you're talking about this and I've got the rest of my life. Now, average life spans, according to Scripture, 70. I've got, I've got this amount of time, so I'm going to play around while I've got the time. A lot of people have done that, and they've left a church service, and they never made it back to another one because they died in between Sundays. Not trying to give a scare tactic here, but I'm saying none of us knows. Uh, as I see the obituaries lately, I've been seeing a lot of younger people if you've been doing that, you've, you've been doing, seeing the same thing. 33, 41, 53. We're, so, we're seeing a lot of it. Life is a vapor, Scripture says. We're here today, we're gone tomorrow. 
We need to make sure that we say yes to Christ. Would you bow your heads with me? I know a question like this can be downright discomforting because we we don't like the Lord to get up in our faces. We like the, the soft and meek and mild version of Jesus that will leave us alone and let us do our own thing, but we don't like the, the version that loves us enough to keep us out of hell. I don't know what God's saying to you in this moment, but I believe He's speaking. It's an unusual message. Not, not something I want to take lightly. If you need to come to Christ today for salvation, there are people here today who would love to help you get that secure. Maybe today you've just been playing around and, and asked that question about is there any enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian. You might say, Matthew, eh, not really. You know this altar's open. So we're going to pray. We're going to have a song. We'll just continue, ask you to continue to be in an attitude of prayer. As, as the song's sung, if you need to come pray, come need, need to come talk to me, whatever. Just do what the Lord's saying to you in this moment. Father, My heart can't help but be touched by a man who had so much conviction and believed so deeply in his heart that Christ was the only way, is the only way, that he had no reservations at all about dying for the one who died for him. God, are we at that point where we're willing to say, Lord, you gave your life for me, so I'll give my life to you and even for you. I don't know what you're saying here to, to each individual heart in this moment, but God, I pray during this time the people will respond as your spirit speaks. We pray this in Christ's name. I encourage you to just keep your heads bowed and eyes closed. Those of you who need to come forward, please do so. Without him, I could do nothing. Without him, I surely fail. Without him, I without a Jesus oh Jesus do you know him today you can't turn him away, oh, Jesus.
Jesus, thank God I'm saved. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? You can't turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, without him how lost I would. turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, without him how lost I would be. Amen and amen. You can go ahead and look this way. Um, we'll go ahead and come off the air.